Okay. All right. So in today's group meeting, we have uh, Bruno uh, that's going to tell us about uh, we are sort of here and killing horizon entropy. So Bruno, go ahead. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks, Eduardo, for the introduction. Uh, as he was saying, I'm going to talk about Gerosor hair and entropy for exosymmetric killing horizons, which is based on a work that I did with Ling Ching Sheng and Anthony Speranza, who were two postdocs uh, that were in PI last year, and two classmates from my master's, Wan Zhen Shu and Shui Liu. Uh, the work has been published on Physical Review Letters last December. And here's the archive number in case you were, if you, you want to check that too. Uh, the PRL is open to open access, but in case you want, if you prefer archive anyway. Okay, so the outline of the talk is roughly as follows. Uh, first, I'm gonna say a few quick words about things that I already talked about in previous talks in this group meeting that are mainly concerning uh, covariant phase phase formalism and diffeomorphism charges, in, in particular now for the case of gravitational theories. And then I'm going to go to the core of the talk, which is going to be about a symmetry algebra that you can define for a very general class of solutions to Einstein's equations that are described by axisymmetric killing horizons. I'm going to show how you can make sense of a near horizon uh, symmetry that acts on the geometry of those spacetimes, and how that naturally leads to a symmetry algebra that's given by the, the symmetry group of a conformal field theory in two dimensions, also known as a real sorrow algebra. And from that, you can compute the, the entropy of a putative 2D CFT that's dual to that geometry by the standard result in conformal field theory in two dimensions that's encoded in the so called Cardi formula. So, uh, besides the reference from the, the main paper that I posted on the, on the first slide, these are a couple of useful references to like. Uh, grow the background that is useful for for this kind of research program. Uh, this is a reference from last year about covariant phase space with boundaries, which is relevant for some of the formalism that makes the results a little bit more solid. I'm not gonna go to into too much detail on the subtleties associated with uh, charges defined in null surfaces, which is kind of the uh, uh, the main subtlety of this topic. But then again, it's useful to know that. This is something that can be made more precise. Uh, these two references here by comparing Fiorucci and Walden Zupas are more uh, standard ones on covariant phase space for different morphism invariant theories. And this last one is a follow up paper on this project by one of the co authors and uh, another collaborator that, again, uh, puts into a more precise notion some of the things that were outlined on, on the results that we got. So, as usual, again, uh, I'm just going to spend a few minutes uh, recalling some basic concepts on differential geometry so that we are on the same page. So, we've, we will be using systematically the technology of differential forms. Uh, differential forms are a particular kind of tensor, or anti-symmetric tensors with all the indices down, uh, on which you can define a notion of derivative that's given by the exterior derivative. And again, as I mentioned previously on other talks, I'm going to be using systematically both a notion of space-time exterior derivative that acts as a that acts on on tensors defined on the space-time manifold, and a phase-space exterior derivative where the phase space again is going to be understood as a covariant phase space. Uh, so just to be just for completeness, here is the the coordinate expression for uh, uh, exterior derivative of a, of a p form of a general p form. Uh, given a vector field on a, on a manifold in a differential form, there is the, there's also this other notion of derivative, that's the inner derivative or the interior product that's given in components by this. And you can also define a third notion of derivative, uh, defined in terms of the flow along the integral curves of vector field. And that naturally leads to the lead derivative, which is related to the interior derivative and the exterior derivative by the Cartons magic formula, as we should all know by now. Uh, now, another useful structure to have in mind when you have a spacetime with a with a metric or a manifold with a metric that defines a spacetime is the volume form, which in components is given by this expression, where g here is the determinant of, determinant of the metric in the x mu coordinate system that's being used to define this expression. 
And a useful operation to have in mind once you have a people, once you have a volume form is called the Hodge dual, which in D dimensions sends a P form to a D minus P form. And the expression in components is given by this. So it's basically the contraction of the all the indices of the P form with uh, equivalent indices of the volume form. Uh, and again, just for completeness, I absorbed the square root of minus g, the definition of this tensor epsilon here, uh, just for brevity of notation. And just again, for completeness, I will just remind you that we'll be using natural units all throughout the, the presentation. So Newton's constant, the speed of light, h bar, and both max constants will all be set to one. And so, okay, let's go. Uh, as I, I mentioned on previous talks on covariant phase space, for any Lagrangian field theory uh, defined on a space time, you can naturally define uh, a phase space formalism that does not require any explicit break of covariance. And the way to do that goes roughly as follows. Uh, you take your field theory that's defined in terms of, of an action that will be the integral of a Lagrangian D form if your space time has D dimensions. And the Lagrangian form again can be seen as a Lagrangian scalar density times the volume form. That's probably more familiar to, to most people. And the way you define the presymplectic form, which is the basic uh, algebraic object of phase space, is by this. Now, you take the Lagrangian or the action equivalently, and you vary the dynamical fields. Now, by any, for, for any theory, you know that by basically doing intervention by parts manipulations, this is always going to be something like a term that's linear on the linearized variations of the field and a boundary term. The boundary terms, the thing that you throw away uh, to get to the equations of motion, and the equations of motion are simply the, the coefficients that, that match the linearized variations here, as we all know. But it turns out that this boundary term, called the presymplectic potential, is the the object that allows you to define the presymplectic form, right? So just a reminder. Now we're going to be working on these dual notions of various quantities. There are tensors both on space time and on phase space. Theta, in particular here, it takes linearized variations on uh, the space of solutions to the equation of motion and returns a, new, a real number. So it makes sense to think of them as a one form on space time on phase space. Sorry. And by construction, it was also a D minus one form in space time. So just to emphasize that there are two notions in which, uh, two, two senses in which various quantities there are, that are going to be introducing our tensors in different manifolds. Uh, now, the presymplectic currents is defined as the phase space exterior derivative of this presymplectic potential. That's why it was called a potential uh, to begin with. And then the presymplectic form is just obtained by integrating this presymplectic currents over a Cauchy surface for uh, your space time. Now, as some of you may remember, the reason why I'm calling this presymplectic form is that technically this construction will not lead to a non-degenerate uh, two form here. Uh, if, if you have zero modes that are related to gauge transformations. And throughout this, this presentation, I ask you to assume that I have taken care of all these zero modes by quotienting out those degenerate directions. And that will be implicit in all of the statements that I'm going to be making in a way that will become more or less clear as we move along. So uh, something that we can define once we have all this structure is this notion of a vector field uh, on configuration space. So in the uh, space of fields that, that you treat as dynamical on your theory, that up until this point don't have to necessarily satisfy the equation of motion. That I'm, that's why I'm calling it configuration space and not phase space. And uh, an important notion that is is used when you talk about this is the the notion of tensors which are covariant under various different morphisms. And precisely what we mean by this is that the covariant the lead derivative on space time coincides with the lead derivative on phase space. This is a non-trivial requirement in particular for theories which have background structures, in which case the lead derivative on uh, phase space 
is basically defined so that this definition holds. So it only involves variations of the dynamical fields. Whereas the leader relative on space time will act on whatever tensor fields you have, uh, no matter if they were, they were dynamical fields or not. So yeah, the usefulness of this notion of, uh, of covariance under uh, particular diffeomorphism is that you can show that if you have the Lagrangian that's covariant under diffeomorphism, you can show that it leads to a conserved current. And the way to go is pretty straightforward. First, you know that by definition of this leader derivative in phase space, the variation of the Lagrangian is given by the leader derivative in phase space again, uh, which if it is covariant is equal to the space time leader derivative, but then since the Lagrangian is a top form on space time, this reduces to a boundary term. So you have this equality that holds regardless of whether the field configuration or you are evaluating the Lagrangian satisfies the equation of motion or not. Uh, but if you take as an input that the field configuration is actually uh, a solution to the equation of motion, you can use this fact to show that you get a conserved quantity on shell. And also it's useful to know that when this condition is satisfied, so if the action is varied just by a pure boundary term under the action of this diffeomorphism, it, you're guaranteed to have this diffeomorphism taking old solutions to the equation of motion to new solutions. And so in this case, the, the vector field on phase space Xi really constitutes a legitimate phase space vector field. It's not a, it's not just, a, uh, it, it will take Essentially, the coefficients of the, the vector field satisfy the linearized equations of motion. Uh, okay, so on the other hand, now this is simply the, the extra step that's required to explicitly show that, it, that you're alive to a conserved current. Uh, and what you basically need to do is just use the equations of motion again from the alternative uh, form of the variation of the Lagrangian. And when the equation of motion is satisfied, if you use the previous uh, result that we had from the other slide, you can show that there is this J uh, that depends on the deformation of psi, which is closed when the equation of motion is satisfied. So it's closed on shell. And of course that's, that leads them to a, to a conserved current or conserved charge if you want. Uh, if you assume suitable boundary conditions on, on the boundaries of your spatial sections. Uh, yeah, so this is all just revealed. That's why I'm being a bit quick on that. I, uh, I hope this is a little bit familiar to most of you. Now, in general relativity in particular, or actually in any uh, gravitational theory, we expect the underlying theory to display general covariance or also called in this context, diffeomorphism invariance which in particular means that the Lagrangian should be covariant under any diffeomorphism psi. This is in particular automatically satisfied, for example, when you have a, a Lagrangian for your dynamical theory, which doesn't have any background structure. So this again, I think we might be tempted to call it also background independence in this case. Uh, in this case, again, you can show that not only is there a Jake psi that satisfies the continuity equation for any um, for any diffeomorphism psi, but also this J is exact on phase on space time. So it means it's the extra derivative of something, where this Q is called in this context the another charge d minus two point. And in this case, the Hamiltonian that we had previously defined as the integral of, of this current on a Cauchy surface reduces to a boundary integral on the boundary of these spatial sections. So this is pretty important for the conceptual implications of these constructions of uh, phase space variables in gravity and, and observables in different mechanism invariant theories, because in particular it says that it, it is consistent with that idea that there are no local observables in the diffeomorphism invariant theory. Or the, if, for example, if you have uh, space times with compact to spatial sections, this necessarily guarantees that all uh, observables on phase space vanish on shell. So they're all, they're all zero on shell, which is consistent with the idea that 
different morphisms are gauge gauge transformations on on these sorts of spaces. Uh, yeah, so this is just emphasizing what I was saying. Uh, for different morphisms in varying theory, different morphisms uh, reduce reduce to quantities. Uh, different morphism charges reduce to quantities evaluated on spatial boundaries. Uh, when there are no non-trivial structures on, on the spatial boundaries, or when the different morphisms act trivially close to the boundaries, uh, they define vanishing charges, which we as discussed previously are tempted to associate to true gauge transformations. But when you have some non-trivial boundary structure, whether it be asymptotically, for example, in asymptotically flat spacetimes or in asymptotically ADS, or at a finite distance, for example, the the boundary structure due to the presence of a horizon, for example, from the black hole. These transformations that act non-trivially on such boundary uh, are seen then as becoming physical. And the one, one way this manifests itself is by the existence of these non-vanishing charges. Uh, yeah, and these charges again go by many names in the literature. They're called edge modes. In various contexts, they're also called soft hair. And one place in which they become relevant is, for example, in general gauge theories, where they are useful to making sense of the notions of entanglement, entanglement entropy between localized regions in, in, in gauge theories, and in particular in different morphism environment theories. And in this case, we'll see how they are a powerful tool to account for some semi-classical derivation, some semi-classical statistical derivation of the back in time housing entity, for example. Uh, so are there any questions so far? Or should I continue? OK. Uh, yeah, so all that I said so far is pretty general. Now let's focus on the case of interest, which is general relativity. Uh, we all know, again, that general relativity can be defined in terms of the Einstein-Hilbert action. Where the Lagrangian demand or the Lagrangian deform is given just by the Ricci scalar times the volume form. Uh, now, we probably all did this exercise at least once in our lives. You vary this Lagrangian with respect to the metric. The linear term will give you Einstein's equations, and you have, and you'll get also the boundary term as usual. Where the form of this boundary term is perhaps less well known for most people off the top of their of their heads, but this is something that's not. So hard to compute either. And I'm kind of neglecting some subtleties associated to, for example, the presence of a Gibbons Hawking term that, that is the boundary term of the action, and also the presence of the cosmological constant here that, in principle, you could introduce because essentially that will not change the this uh, bulk term of the presymplectic form. The cosmological constant term will not change anything on the person plastic potential because it doesn't give you any boundary contribution because there's no kinetic term for the metric there. And the Gibbons Hawking term is a bit more subtle and I won't have time to discuss it, but uh, up to some caveats, everything works without these considerations. So that's uh, now, if you just run the recipe that I described earlier and you look for what is what are the different morphism charges associated to an arbitrary DPO psi, which leads to a then uh, variation on the metric given by the derivative. You can explicitly show that indeed the conserved charges are given by currents which are exact on phase space. And the explicit form of this Q, of this little Q here, is given by this. So it's just an exterior derivative of this psi is seen as a one form and not a vector field. In this case, then, that expression that I had for the, the charge reduces to a Colmar integral on the boundary of the Cauchy surface, which is probably familiar to, to some of you. Uh, that reduces to the definition of uh, angular momentum and mass and, AD, and ADM mass in asymptotically flat space times, for example. And now we're seeing that it holds more generally for these different morphisms that act non trivially on the boundaries in partial signal. And once we have that, then we can talk about the algebra that is satisfied by these classes, by, by this class of different morphisms. And the way we do that is again by simply plugging these vector fields on phase space 
into the simple active form. And that defines a Poisson bracket on phase space. And that is automatically the algebraic structure that you have on phase space. OK? So now I think we are ready to go to the core of the subject again to see how this whole structure plays out in axisymmetric Killing Horizon. So the, the setup here is the following. We have a uh, space-time containing a bifurcate axisymmetric Killing Horizon in dimensions equal to or larger than three. So this means that we have, uh, oh yeah, we're assuming that the, the horizon is non-degenerate, so it has non-zero surface gravity. So we have a horizon generating Killing Vector will be denoted by chi with sur surface gravity kappa. We have a co-dimension two submanifold that is left invariant in the direction of this diffeomorphism and that defines the so-called bifurcation surface. And we'll also have a second killing vector. That's the axisymmetric part, which is associated to, to axial rotations along some axis. And it has closed orbit, orbits and commutes with the horizon generating killing vector. Now with this structure, I, I can also define a radio vector field that will be useful to our construction of conformal coordinates. And the radio vector field is again, just essentially the gradient of the norm of the, of the horizon generating uh, vector field. Remembering that the horizon in this case is defined as the, the level surface where the killing vector field becomes null, right? And you can show that with this definition, using Killing equation, the fact that psi and chi commutes, this radio vector field will also commute with the two Killing vector. This means that those three vectors can be used to compose part of a coordinate basis where each of them corresponds to partial derivatives with respect to a temporal coordinate that I'm denoting T, a radio coordinate that I'm denoting as R star because this will be exactly the tortoise coordinate that some of you may be familiar with when studying like near horizon geometries. And phi here is the angle that parameterizes this uh, uh, axial direction, which here should be thought of as the co-rotating angle in the case of, uh, of a horizon with some angular momentum. So, if you were in curve, for example, this phi here is actually the defined Borel Lindquist minus omega t, where omega is the, uh, is the angular velocity of the horizon. So the, the picture is roughly the following again. Here I'm emphasizing the bifurcation surface and the horizon that has four components. There are the right and left future and past components, respectively. And everything that we'll be doing will be focused on what happens in this side, which is basically the Ringler wedge. This, this picture is analogous to the Ringler wedge. Uh, as we approach the bifurcation surface, both from the future and from the past horizon. So uh, just for convenience, we'll reparameterize the radio coordinate by, by this uh, transformation here. And the reason why we do that is that once we do this, this X has the interpretation of the radio proper distance to the horizon, at least at the leading order, which is always going to be interesting. So after doing all this, you can show that with the ingredients that we previously had, the metric on a near horizon expansion uh, for any axisymmetric symmetric horizon in this case, decomposes into a linear order term that is that looks exactly like Rindler on the xt plane with a, a transverse metric on the phi and theta directions where theta here correspond to the to all the other transverse coordinates that together with phi define a, a topological sphere uh, on space time and you get the the subleading corrections for higher orders of of x squared and out of all these terms, the only one that will really contribute to anything that we we'll say afterwards is this one that contains the dt to phi term, so the cross term between the between the t coordinate and the phi coordinate, because this will essentially encompass the 
the shift vector in the phi direction that gives you the angular momentum. So that's why I'm emphasizing that up to the most part, uh, you, you only have to pay attention to this leading order term because this is just saying that uh, essentially any non-degenerate horizon roughly looks like Rendler when you go sufficiently close to it. So uh, a useful way to parameterize the approach to the bifurcation surface along the horizons is by defining these uh, node modes of these parameters uh, by finite coordinate values that are defined, that will be defined as this. So W plus and W minus are simply the uh, radial coordinates times exponential of plus or minus kappa t uh, times an exponential factor that depends on the angle. And the reason why we're introducing this uh, dependence on the angle will become clear as we move as well. And so this factor here, these factors here are just the crystal coordinates V and U that parameterize against the first horizon. The future horizon is sitting at W minus equals zero, the past horizon is sitting at W plus equals zero. And the bifurcation surface is then labeled by both coordinates being equal to zero. Uh, we finalize this coordinate change by introducing a third coordinate that plays a role that's roughly analogous to a radial coordinate, as we will see. And the way we do this is by requiring this constraint, which uniquely defines after we use equation 30, this y to be given by this. So together, these coordinates, w plus w minus y, are called the conformal coordinates. And when we transform to these coordinates and we expand near the bifurcation surface, so that means we only keep lowest order terms in W plus and W minus, the metric becomes this. So the reason why this is interesting, again, these subleading terms don't matter that much. What I'm mainly interested, what I want you guys to focus your attention on, your attention on is again, this leading order part, because uh, this, W plus, w plus W minus Y component here is precisely uh, ADS3 metric, a locally ADS3 metric with uh, a well-defined radius uh, or ADS radius times a transverse metric again in the orthogonal directions. So yeah, the linear part corresponds to a local ADS metric with uh, uh, ADS radius that does not depend on W plus, W minus, or Y, but depends on theta. And there's also a transverse mesh from theta. Now, since we had also these uh, dependent, this dependence on phi, that's periodic, these coordinates will also display some periodic conditions here, some periodic identifications. And this essentially means that these locally ADS folia that, that, are, that we are constructing near the horizon have a structure that's more similar to how you construct a BTZ black hole, which you do basically by taking ADS3 and performing this quotients by finite translations, which in that case are associated essentially to temperatures. And again, we'll see that this very concretely is also the case in in this situation too. That's basically what will allow us to, to give a description of all these class of axisymmetric cooling horizons in terms of a 2D CFT. In the end. Uh, basically what's hiding behind it all is just like ADS3 CFT2 correspondence in any case. But yeah, so do we have any questions so far? Okay. Okay, so now that we have this uh, background structure, so to speak, uh, not exactly background structure, but we have this, this reference solutions or reference class of solutions to the space time, we are in interested in a class of diffeomorphisms which preserve uh, some of this structure. In this in particular case, roughly speaking, you can think of it as the class of diffeomorphisms that preserve these ADS3 foliation type of, of expansions near the horizon. 
and you can show that these are all, this can all be labeled by these two sets of vector fields, of independent vector fields. That here I'm calling yeah, uh, psi, oh, zeta and psi. So, and yeah, they, they can be expanded like this. So psi, oh, sorry, zeta uh, only acts on the W plus Y directions or W plus Y plane. And psi only acts on the W minus Y plane. Those two are commuting. And again, because of these periodic identifications, these functions here are labeled by integers and they can be expanded like this in W plus and W minus respectively. Uh, yeah, they these the why the, the reason why these vector fields are important is that they satisfy uh, with algebra, which is the non 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 is like the zero sort of algebra with zero central charge, essentially, and it's given completely by this. And now all we have to do then is to see how they act on the gravitational phase space by representing them in terms of canonical charges and computing the Poisson brackets. Uh, the result is that there is a general theorem that says that whenever you do this procedure of representing the, the algebra of vector fields on phase space via the Poisson bracket, the algebra is, uh, is reproduced exactly up to a central extension. And the unique central extension to the width algebra is the Virasor algebra. So we are guaranteed to have this additional term called this the central extension term to be of this form, right? Where you can see that it only depends on one single parameter for both uh, left and right moving modes. And this parameter is called the central charge. So yeah, now again, you just run through the recipe using the, the presymplastic current and the the prism classic form that you can infer from the, the Einstein Hibbert action and then plugging in the different morphisms that we're considering here. The result that you get for the central charge for both the left and right moving modes is given by this, where you see A uh, here showing up and A is just the area of the bifurcation surface. Uh, and J here is the angular momentum carried by the horizon. But here, I'm, you're only seeing an integral over the transverse directions, but the factor of two pi here just comes because you are also integrating over the, the axial angle. And since this is a killing vector field, we, the integral of that is always gonna come with a two pi factor up front. So, yeah, so far the, the conditions uh, on these parameters alpha and beta are non-existent, non-existent basically, uh, but there are some consistency conditions that we can apply at this point, such as the requirement for the Hamiltonians to actually be integrable on phase space and the vanishing of the so-called gravitational anomaly. Uh, and that is essentially an argument that leads us to require that the central charges for both left and right linear, right moving modes uh, are equal. If you, if you impose that on the expressions that I had earlier, you, you get a constraint on the difference between alpha and beta. Uh, and those have to be proportional to the angular momentum on the horizon. And when you plug that back in the, in the expressions that I had for the sensor charge, the value that you get, again, by construction, it, it has to be equal and it's proportional just to the area of the black hole, of the, of the application surface in this case. So there's no explicit dependence on the angular momentum anymore here. Uh, now, something that we can also use at this point is that basically by extending the notion of a hard or Hawking vacuum, essentially, on the near horizon region of the black hole, uh, this is just a heuristic argument, but it, you can make it more, more rigorous. Uh, you can think of the quantum states for, for quantum fields that live right outside uh, of the horizon from the perspective of people who are on, for observers that are only on the right regular wedge to be of this form. So it's a thermal state with respect to the generator of the horizon here, K, where this 
sat chi sorry, where this k here should be roughly speaking a like a, a wave vector or something of some sort. And the interesting thing is that you can write the horizon generating killing vector as a linear combination of the zero modes, both for the right and left moving parts of these conformal transformations. Um, by defining the right and left frequencies analogously to what we had for the, the frequency with respect to the horizon generating killing vector, the, this simply can be written as analogous to this, which suggests that we can define these right and left moving temperatures for, for the CFT in terms of these parameters alpha and beta, right? Uh, now, from CFT argument alone, or from a statistical derivation of uh, the entropy of two DCFT chart, two DCFTs with these same central charges and these temperatures. Uh, the entropy can be computed rather universally by the Cardi formula, which is given by this in the limit of large temperatures. Uh, and if you plug in the results that we got from the central charges and from these temperatures, the Cardi entropy from this putative to the CFT that matches these temperatures and central charges reproduces exactly the beckenstein hawking entropy of the horizon. So this was the main result of, of the work, which we see as providing some hints on what are the bare minimum ingredients of a quantum theory, and also what are the classical degrees of freedom of general relativity alone, which look like, which seem to be sufficient to account for uh, statistical derivation of the beckenstein hawking entropy. And the reason why we say this is because, uh, again, we only identify them at, as these uh, edge modes, essentially, or this soft hair that lives on the vicinity of the horizon. And we just use the fact that they're the only quantum ingredient that we used was the uh, existence of this dual 2D CFT, essentially, which was led naturally by the symmetry algebra that's represented on the gravitational phase space. And it looks like what we achieve is really the, the complete result for the Bechstein Hawking entropy of a horizon. Uh, some people may think that is. Uh, shows that uh, quantum description of a much more general class of classical spacetimes, at least in some sort of semi-classical limits, may involve a CFT. Uh, the reason for that is, again, that the, the only assumptions that we used to, as an input for this, this work apply, for example, to asymptotically flat spacetimes, where there has been a growing uh, research program on flat space holography, which also matches this to, to, to the CFTs. And in particular, it also applies to a cosmological horizon in the city space, for example, which, turn, which happened to be the original motivation for the Winter School projects back in January last year. Uh, yeah, and, and you may also see this as pointing towards near exploration for holography you know, in, a, in, a, in a range of setups that is much wider than what could usually be anticipated by simply ADS-CFT. So that's pretty much what I had for today. I hope this was somewhat enlightening. I, yeah, that's it. I'd be glad to, to answer any questions. All right, cool. Very nice, Bruno. Any questions, people? Thales? Well, Bruno, first of all, it was do caralho. Uh, congratulations. <laughs> um, now, I, I do have a question, Dan, because, like, I mean, the, the, the result is very nice, right? You, you use the, this, this, like, sort of uh, only classical arguments, uh, with the exception, maybe, perhaps, you could argue of the CFD, uh, ADS CFD, but that's like, okay. Uh, it, to, to deduce the, the Bekenstein Hawking entropy for a general level. That, this is like very, very, very nice. Now, uh, I, we could previously do this with uh, some, some other black holes. Like, so for example, if, in Schwarzschild, I could uh, go there and make a periodic time identification and, and 
make an analogy with thermodynamics, du equals tds and things like this to obtain an entropy or something like this. Uh, we can do the, this for some other black holes, like something like this. So uh, I guess that my question is, um, it, it's not as much about your work, it's more about what we used to have before it. So did we have a general classical argument to compute to, to compute the, the Bakkenstein Hawking entropy for a general black hole? Well, uh, a purely classical argument would come again. So something that you could do is the most straightforward thing that I see is probably something you, you're also aware of, which is you use uh, the first law of black hole mechanics to motivate that kappa delta A is, pro is related to T delta S. And then you use this replica trick on the, like on the Euclidean uh, path integral for, for the gravitational uh, for the space time to show that in pretty much the same setup that we have here, where you get this near horizon expansion in terms of Rindler coordinates, basically Rindler space, that trick will always work to give the temperature equal to, to cap over two pi. So there's nothing more general here that wouldn't be applied there for you to derive the temperature of the black hole. And then you use the argument from semi classical gravity to say that, okay, if uh, I don't know, kappa over a pi. Uh, delta A is T delta S, and I fix T to be cap of two, over two pi. Now I know that the entropy must be A over four. But there is there's something insufficient in that argument in the sense that you still don't have any statistical understanding of what, what are these degrees of freedom that are being counted to the entropy alone. You cannot have to. So you might find it annoying to go to the temperature to then go to the entropy and use the first law of black hole mechanics. I don't know. Uh, so, so like, any uh, argument, you're saying, any you argument, don't have okay. to go through the, the, the first law term of black hole thermodynamics to, to get your to get your result. You'd argue that that is a, a, a gain in this sense. I'm not yeah. sure. Not only I'm, that, not, I mean, I'm, not, I'm not sure because you can do exactly the same thing uh, when you do uh, the from the law of black hole, first law of black hole mechanics, you can now say, OK, let me just model the degrees of freedom with a scalar field if I want. And then you get exactly the A over four. Uh, so you can have a statistical sense of, I mean, again, it depends on how much you believe those fields are. Those fields that are on top of gravity, are they part of gravity? What structure is it? I think that the derivation in itself is nice, but it's not like the groundbreaking bit of it. I think the groundbreaking bit of it is to me, I mean, again, this is my impression. It's like, holy shit, dude, this is not ADS. <laughs> this is way more general than ADS. And uh, it's kind of like every time we make the argument of how compelling is uh, the CFT argument, right? Because, yeah, sure, only works for, for, for ADS, but it's so compelling that it must be something general to it. I'm kind of I would argue that the, the breakthrough thing of this is associating these charges, like, because it, it, it's as if you were finding out classical quotation mark degrees of freedom or, or classical uh, quantities that are responsible for this, for the, the, the black hole entropy. That's you know? also so true that's... in the usual case though. That's what I mean. In the, in the usual derivation, that's also true. Well, oh, well I mean, you're... my, my food, food just got here. I, I'll still go. Okay. Well, then he leaves. Yeah, I mean, kind of my I, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, technically you could also be like, Skeptical about the argument that uses uh, like quantum field theory in curve space times alone, which is like putting a scalar field on top of it and computing the same entropy between outgoing, like uh, inner modes and outer modes that live inside and outside the horizon, respectively. Uh, because what you get there is roughly, is like strictly speaking, a UV divergence in terms of an entropy that you argue is regularized by a renormalization of Newton's constant, which is fine again. But I think that this represents a gain as well in the sense that you are generally treating, in this case, gravity as dynamical. So you're not uh, computing scalar fields on top of a fixed background. You're allowing the background to vary. So I mean, somehow this could be accounting for, I don't know, dynamical effects of gravity that people hand wavily say are like regulating this renormalization on Newton's constant on the use of derivation. Which, uh, which depends on like computing the entropies of scalar fields that's in on top of a fixed background. But for me, this derivation puts it into a more like a much more solid uh, setting. Yeah. 
and and just just opposed, opposed to what you said, I do this ADS three uh, thing. I mean, I, I, my opinion is that so so far it's like it's a very useful uh, technique that we have because it has so many very good properties. In this case, like what he did here is essentially performing this very smart Fourier transformation based on the, the symmetries of the, the space times and the generators of the, the horizon and all that in order to, to obtain something that looks like AES, uh, ADS3. Yeah. And after that, it was only like, uh, it was like straightforward co uh, computation, quotation marks. Would you yeah, disagree with this? Or, or or is there... This is not something you see every day though. That's the thing. Uh, the arguments outside of ADS, even if it's like with a clever way of doing this and setting quantization in all coordinates and so on, I think that the technical progress that's necessary to actually do it made it that people didn't do it before. I don't know. I mean, that might be the reason. It's non-trivial. Conceptually, it's very really non-trivial to do that shit. Even if it's a change of coordinates, as you say, to make it look as the sitter. Of course, the, the, when you make compelling arguments with ADS, right, the, the idea is like, okay, there must be a way in which we can cast this as the ADS problem. And basically, I don't know, I have the feeling like looking at Bruno's uh, work that this is, you know, this as much as you can get, this is as general as you can get. And now everything else will be just deviations from the useful stuff. And when you actually, so what you would expect is for, for, for cases you have asymptotically, asymptotically flat space time, you expect this area law. If you have any other case, yeah, of course, you may not expect it. There might be corrections to it. See what I mean? I mean, what Bruno to me is saying is saying, look how gen we get in this argument, this ADS argument to the most general possible way we can get it. And everything else would be details. We don't care about that, but we're capturing, it's way stronger to say that in this context than just to say, like, oh, this is ADS CFT and works for ADS. What Bruno is showing is like, look, this is the kind of symmetries that you need for it to work. And that okay, is- So Bruno, can you say something about it? Like, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Again, yeah, this is opinion I, I, though. Again, I may be getting it wrong, but that's my, my view on that. Yeah, I, I think there are good reasons to, to believe on both of what, on what you guys are saying. I would just add that, uh, like reinforce the fact that one of the novelties of what, one of the things that in particular the referee of the PRL really liked about this was that uh, the geometrical construction that we let, that led us to this ADS reformulation was pretty robust. And this was something that people hadn't realized before. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there were some arguments spread around the literature about uh, soft hair on Schwarzschild and soft hair on Kerr, which was the, uh, which is now Pretty strong, like the per CFT correspondence, but the character of these periodic identifications on the conformal coordinates was a little bit more obscure than what we did now. So, yeah, I think this, yeah, that's how I see it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there are still some conceptual issues that are not resolved. Uh, for example, uh, the one thing that you might be puzzled about is how on earth can it then, so in particular, this setup should apply to ADS in higher dimensions as well, when you have a black hole in horizon, when you have a black hole in ADS in higher dimensions. In that case, you expect the, the duality to be between ADS and D dimensions with a, with a CFT in D minus one dimensions. And, not, and in this case, the, the dual theory is fixed to be a 2D CFT. So there seems to be some dimensional reduction going on there with this choice of generators that we don't quite understand. And yeah, I, I don't have anything smart to say about this, except that this is something that is a bit puzzling. Uh, something else, which is also like, we've been thinking about it after we released this project which is what role some additional geometric structures on the on the original background metric play on this derivation. So for example, if there could be any understanding of these geometrical objects that we are preserving on these vector fields in terms of hidden symmetries from killing tensors or, for, or from killing nano tensors that uh, allow for, gen for very nice properties of for example, the scalar wave equation or the Dirac equation in, in a very wide range of black holes, whether that's playing any role here as well. This is something that we as a group think is, it will be interesting to look at, but then again, it's, it's also open. And, and something else, uh, do you think that uh, you'd be able to 
make a similar derivation if you had like not only the the like because in the end the uh, the thing is that you have like three uh, important vector fields for your your uh, for your construction right and that is why you can build your double plus double minus and y coordinates and then compare that with ABS and then do that. Uh, um, what would happen in the case that you were handling a structure that would require four, for example? Do you think that we would be able to make a, a, a similar argument or, or something like this? Or does this depend explicitly on the fact that you had three? Well, I think this is also related to, to this dimensional reduction part of the argument that I don't quite understand. Uh, maybe this so for example if you have additional symmetries on the black hole if you have more than than one actual uh killing vector which might happen for example in myers perry black holes in higher dimensions there may be some additional contribution or some alternative degree of freedom that you can impose that you can introduce based on this second uh actual killing vector and i don't know that may be the the tool that allows you to go from a CFT2 to a CFT3, I don't know. But yeah, at this point, all I have to say is speculation. Right? <laughs> but for for uh, myers Perry one, I think the same results, you can get the same results at least if you restrict all the actual directions to be like pointing in a specific direction relative to each other. In the most general case, I think you have to do a lot of hard work. Right? Yeah, I mean, what we just said here, like, what, what I described here also applies to myers Perry if you just pick one. So you just say, uh, I this is my favorite axis. I want to pick this as the yes, yes, yes. vector. And it all goes uh, as like as I've described. Yeah, with, yeah. The thing is yeah, that- The problem is the other axis, I guess, right? Yeah, but yeah. It might be a bit disappointing that the additional symmetries don't play any role. So that's, that's something that, uh, yeah might be useful to look into as well, but. Uh, Bruno, I have a stupid, I have a stupid question. So, so this whole calculation about Cardi formula and stuff, right? You are essentially doing it on gravitational phase space, right? Yeah, the, the, the data for the CFT, so the central charge and the temperatures are inferred from the, from geometrical constructions that, that are defined on on the background space time and on the gravitational phase space. So yeah. do I understand this correctly that if I were to do this for Kerr Newman, right? The answer is still the same, right? Yeah. yeah. Because because yes, the be gravitational an phase space doesn't know your F mu nu, essentially. I, think. I mean it, yeah, it I knows mean, uh, in terms of the area will depend on the charge, but but essentially yeah, it, will, the, it, will, it will depend. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh this is actually an, an interesting point. Uh if you add uh, like if you pay, if you pick Einstein Hilbert action plus something, for example, uh, any matter fields that you like, and you go through this procedure again, this is something that I think Shui and and Benny Yoshida were looking at uh, this year. Uh, the result that you get in the end for the soft hair, for in particular for the contribution that gets to the central charge, only comes from the gravitational part. So essentially, there's some canceling of the additions to the symplectic potential from yeah, I, from yeah, the matter field at the end. And the answer that you get in the end is just this Colmar integral that you also get with gravity alone. So the only in information that you get from Kerr Newman and in the case of a charged black hole is how the charge affects the area. In the end. Yes, yes. Uh, That's what that, you get from Walt entropy also, right? Because the partial yeah. derivative of the Lagrangian only depends on the variations with respect to the Riemann curvature, I guess. That's, that's yeah. the, the key. Exactly. Yeah. Cool. And that's also what you get with the auxiliary calculation using a quantum field to model the degrees of freedom too. <laughs> the, the, um, what's the next thing? Are you working on a, on a next step on this, Bruno? Yeah, we've been thinking about, uh, so originally these, this trust of temperatures that I've been mentioning were motivated by studying like scattering problem in a fixed background, like a curved background, where you can look at the solutions to the weight equations in the nearest region regime, and then infer that from like, some uh, matching with CFT data. And, but now we, it, it seems like 
we have an alternative derivation that chooses temperatures differently from what they had. And it also looks like it's consistent with the Bakken-Stein-Hawking uh, entropy. So this is something we, we've been thinking about how to, how to make compatible with each other. Another thing that's related to that is the understanding of these symmetry generators as acting on hidden symmetries of the horizon. So yeah, these are two things that we think are somewhat within reach. Uh, and that's what we've been looking at. So the, the work has been paused for a while because people have been scattered around all places now, unfortunately. But yeah, this mm -hmm. is something that we think should all be right. doable soon. Great, wonderful. If there are more questions, then let's talk Bruno again. That was a great talk, Bruno. Actually, thank you. Really good, uh, the really good synthesis, like giving a summary of <laughs> face space, a Korean face space at the same time as talking as you're in a finite amount of time. It's kind of cool. <laughs> yeah, I, I hope that I hope the the previous lectures were useful. For, yeah, for no, it wasn't even fine. It was short. It was great. It was yeah, perfect yeah. on time on the spot. If you know, if you know, I think this kind of introduction.